Shonda, who will be sharing some opening remarks and guidance for what to expect. Insert chat box. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I am so thankful to be here um, with you all on this afternoon. And thank you all for taking some time out of your afternoon to be on this call to hear a little bit more about what we are doing and to hear a little bit more about this project. So I wanted to be able to share um, a little bit why I am, why I wanted to do this call and a little bit more about my time um, in the fellowship and what led to, to my passion on doing this. And so for some of you who know uh, a little bit about the work that I do, you know that I am passionate about a lot around homelessness and hunger and making sure people have some of the things that they need. And so um, part of my my project with the Come to the Table Fellowship was around addressing the issue of hunger. And so when I started looking at different projects to get involved in, um, I started learning about um, the CSA boxes. And so I started learning about connecting local congregations with local farmers and doing CSA boxes in which the congregations could purchase these boxes, not just for themselves, but also purchasing them for their community. So in the midst of all of that, and I started learning about these CSA boxes and how we could um, purchase those, I started learning a little bit more about farming. And so for me, it wasn't just about how can we get this fresh produce on the table? I started learning a little bit about farming. And I started saying farming was not just about um, getting food on the table. Farming was, we could look at farming and look at how can we use farming as an engine to build social skills in our kids? How can we use farming as an engine to build the mental capacity for our adults? How can we use farming as an engine to you know, help our teens? And so I started looking at farming as a whole at a whole different angle. And then the other thing I started looking at, my mother personally, my mother loves planting. And so here recently, my mother has started loving um, we started buying her different plants again. She started back planting. And I started noticing in the midst of all of this that we got going on with the pandemic, I started just noticing how my mother's, um, how her, her demeanor has changed, right? But since she started planting again and started putting her hands in the soil again, I started noticing how her whole demeanor has changed. And so I started asking her questions, right? about farming because I knew my mother grew up on the farm. So I started asking her questions about growing up, you know, what it was like for her growing up. And so for me, those stories about my family, those stories about, you know, where my family came from, what it was like growing up on the farm, it brought joy to me. So farming was more, has become more for me than just about putting food on the table. I wanted to know more about how does it connect to my faith? How does it connect to our mental health? You know, how do we look at it from a holistic framework? And so I wanted to have, bring, um, bring everybody to the table so we can start having this conversation on how do we um, start looking at um, farming, not just as a economic engine, but how do we begin looking at it um, and bringing our stories in it also? So um, I'm glad we're able to do this conversation. And so I want to be able to uh, let you know where this conversation is headed on today. So if you have any questions as the speakers are, are talking, you can type it in the chat. If we don't get to your question on today, rest assured we will follow up with you. Um, we'll make sure that we provide you with everyone's contact information um, so that you could be able to contact them after this call. Because we're sure sometimes when you get off a call, you're thinking, um, I didn't think of this at the time, but I really do still have another question. And so you will be able to follow up with them even after this. So after I finish, we will have, um, Jewelry will come and he will share a little bit about the state of the um, black communities, uh, historical and current agric agricultural relationship. Then we'll have Reverend Joyner. 
then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about what are your pillars. Then we're going to break out into breakout sessions because we want to hear from you. We want you to be able to share a little bit um, about your story. We want you to be able to talk about um, your family history and be able to share with one another. And then we'll come back together and we'll have some dialogue together. Um, and then we'll have a little bit of time where we'll have some Q&A. So I'm going to turn it over and we're going to go ahead and get started. So Jerry, the call is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, some of you I know, some of you, I'm seeing your face for the first time or your screen, your name for the first time. Um, but my name is Jory Bryant. I am from Durham, North Carolina. I am a descendant of Stadville Plantation here in Durham. And uh, my story, just like many of people of color story, uh, African-American people here in this, in this location, North Carolina story, is directly tied to agriculture. Um, so we're going to walk uh, through some, some historical findings on the relationship of agriculture. But I want you to know this is not just data and facts. These are actual um, stories tied to all of us. And many of us have um, uh, relationships to experiences that we might see as a historical event. Um, and so we're going to get into a presentation. Um, I'm gonna look in the chat and make sure everybody can see it, but I'm assuming. Yeah. So the way I always start out is we just go through what is agriculture. Um, the, the, by definition, people say agriculture is the science and practice of farming, including cultivation of the soil for the growing of crops and the rearing of animals to provide food, wool, and other products. Um, I normally would do a Q&A, a little small Q&A right here and ask people, like what's missing in this, in this definition? Um, and oftentimes what people would say is relationship is one of the greatest things missing right here. Um, to, coop, to move on, just a, 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 a quick fact about land ownership. There are 33 million acres in North Carolina and in 1910, black people own 1 million of those 33 uh, million. Um, but around 1920, uh, there was 925,000 black owned farms representing about 14% of all farms in the U.S. Um, and so we're going to try to go through why, is, how did this come to be, right? And then where we are now. So in 1648, Shirley Plantation begins. This is the, the creation of what we, we know as agriculture in America. Um, and then we saw racism is birthed right after that. Um, you see the Emancipation Proclamation. We're gonna skip forward, we're gonna go through it. Um, if anybody doesn't know anything about North Carolina Agriculture Society, it was actually headed up by many plantation owners. Um, Richard Benahan and, uh, um, uh, man, I'm blanking on it. Thomas Ruffin were one of the two primary uh, people who, who owned that, owned, that were a part of that organization. Um, Thomas Ruffin helped, was one of the key figures in UNC. Richard Benahan, uh daughter married uh, Duncan Cameron, and that compounded, became Stadville Plantation. And these individuals controlled not only that. So Thomas Ruffin also was the Chief Justice, and, uh, and Duncan Cameron and Paul Cameron both headed the agricultural over the state of North Carolina, as well as the railroad system. Um, in 1862, uh, we had uh, Abraham Lincoln created the Homestead Act, which was essentially taking land from indigenous people who already had to move west, and the land grant, which was taking more land for creation of universities um, like Clemson, and uh, we wouldn't get into like the, the, 19, the 1890 land grants until much later, but those became HBCU a land grant uh, universities. In 1863 to 1877, we had a reconstruction era. And then in, in 1883, with the mass production of canning, uh, we start moving into mass producing of uh, growth of food and urbanization directly is linked to that. Um, in 1900, we get the, the first great migration begins to happen. This is great migration is when African-Americans leave the South and start moving to the north, and this is directly impacted by uh, terrorism. 
um, the Jim Crow era and the terrorism of organizations like the Ku Klux Klan and the Red Shirt Party here in North Carolina, led by um, Julian Carr and many other prominent figures, is one of the main reasons why African Americans leave areas in rural North Carolina and move north, primarily to areas like Philly, Washington, D.C., and uh, Queens and Brooklyn. So we're going to talk about a little bit like why um, a lot of people left. Uh, the conditions of sharecropping was one of the major reasons many individuals um, left the South and moved to the North. And depending upon where you go um, in the North depends on where you're coming from in the South. So there's a book called The One From Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson. It lays out a, a pretty critical idea of where individuals go. Um, like I just said, I could tell you by where some people are in Philly, Queens, Brooklyn, that they're from North Carolina. And in some more popular books, um, there are talk discussions about where you stay in those communities, determine what city you were from in the South. Um, Elaine Locke in 1925 writes a book called The New Negro. This book kind of gives a new narrative to individuals who are fleeing the South and moving to the North. Um, it doesn't focus on the, the trauma that they experience through sharecropping and through terrorism. Uh, it kind of gives like a twist to the narrative to kind of say like, we're above agriculture. We're moving past this, um, that's beneath us. And during the same time, there's a reverend in Atlanta um, who is leading at Dexter Memorial Baptist Church prior to Dr. Martin King there, who's trying to get his, farm, his people to go back to the land and farm. And they're saying, no, we're above this. And then they vote him out and they vote um, Dr. Martin Luther King in. Um, the predatory practices of the Department of Agriculture. Um, there's, there's been, obviously, the pick for settlement is one of the greatest storytellers of these practices of, of the Department of Agriculture. But those who did own their land, many of them were treated so negatively around getting loans, being able to purchase seed and products. For their, for their farms that led to them walking away from that land. Um, and then, obviously, I, I spoke about terrorism in local community. Many old people experiencing people driving them off that land um, by through lynching and other practices that were detrimental. Um, as we move into move on into time, uh, we see some historical things that happen. Um, the majority of the U.S. is moving into cities by 1920. Um, and this is directly impacting the way Af African Americans have land access to land. Um, oftentimes, moving into those urban places and not getting access to great jobs when they get there. 1929, we had a Great Depression of 39. And then during that time, the Agricultural Assistant Act is born in 1933, a part of New Deal. and African Americans are not getting access to those acts um, as, as their white counterparts are on farmland. Um, in 1939, 1944, obviously we have the World War II. And then during that time, we are moving more industrially and we start mechanizing farm equipment, getting away from mules. And once again, if you don't have access to be able to get loans, your access to get farm equipment is low. Um, and we have people therefore being weeded out again. Um, and then the 1950s and 1970s, we have the second uh, migration, and it's also comparatively partnered with urban renewal. Um, those individuals who spirit the weeding out from the first two iterations that we spoke about are now moving in more droves up to the north. And, and so far as when I do oral histories, I ask people, where are your parents from, where are your grandparents from, where are your great-grandparents from? Many of them would say, well, they, they, my great grandparents were from Philly because they came in the first migration. And some say, well, they're actually from some small town in North Carolina. Um, and in 1971, the war on drugs began. The reason why I add this, a lot of times people don't understand this part, is that the war on drugs directly impacts agriculture. In the state of North Carolina, we had at one point in time 19 work camps, which was a part of our. Um, punitive system, right? And those 19 work camps were largely housed by, we know, um, African-Americans had made up a large portion of those 
those work camps. Um, the war on drugs exponentially gr 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 greaten the gap of African Americans incarceration. And in like, if you were in Halifax County, uh, you have Tillery State Prison in Caledonia. Caledonia is actually Scottish for the word farm, and that's what is considered. And we have many farm uh, pun punitive systems in North Carolina that provide food not only for those uh, punitive areas, but also for our school system. And so the way that the way that that impacted us also ties into the NAFTA Free Trade Agreement. Um, the NAFTA Free Trade Agreement opened up for us to start globalizing more of our uh, agriculture in in the southern uh, southern hemisphere in this in this uh, part of the world. Um, the Western Hemisphere, actually, in the southern, the southern part of, of this, this hemisphere. And we detrimented many of our partners to the south, our, our neighbors, their economies through the NAFTA Free Trade Agreement. And when we started seeing people migrate to this area from the south, it was largely due to the devastation of their economy. Um, here are some questions that we're going to revisit later. Um, we definitely want to make sure we have access to, to get answer any of your questions. That was just a brief overview. Uh, I will be here to, to talk more about it. I wanted to make sure I gave myself plenty of time to get through that. Um, but now I'm going to hand it off to Reverend Joyner. Thank you, Reverend Joyner. Um, Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. That, that really ties into why we started doing what we're doing in Canada, and really sort of a pitch off from Dexter Baptist Church, looking at um, Canada is a rural farming area, um, uh, eastern part of North Carolina. It is, is borderline on Pitt County and Edgecombe County and Martin County. Uh, Edgecombe County and Canada average income of $21,000 a year per household average when I got there in Canada, we were averaging about 30 funerals a year. A young black America that really with chronic disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and lack of access to health care. And so um, uh, trying to figure out how could we holistically address this issue and deal with the social uh, dysfunctions of poverty and access also deal with the spiritual aspect of, of how do you explain to people that they're, they're, they're practicing, they're worshiping, they're working, but they're still dying and they're still hungry. And, and being the pastor of the church, trying to really talk about how do we really deal with the reality of this. And so we really started uh, a small uh, summer camp, the summer camp that were based on how do we really begin to work with uh, these, these church, this congregation. Our children didn't have access to summer camp because they couldn't pay for it. So we started this agricultural, agribusiness summer camp that they would do their math, the reading, the science, uh, and, and technology through, through this farm. Um, we really didn't think no one would participate. Uh, the first summer, we, we had 100 students to show up and started this process. And so, so we really started with a small, small area in Canada. Needless did I know I'm going to run into the historical pain of people saying, I do, I do not want my children being slaves. I do not want them going through what I had to go through, even though it meant this was the only way we could, could finance and get food on the table. Uh, it was a tough year. The church, re the church really rebelled against it. Uh, had members that said they would vote me out, and, uh, uh, and some people left the church because they really did not want to see themselves going into farming. This is like uh, probably 16 years ago. Uh, there were literally no grants out for, for what we were trying to do. And so we spent that first year suffering through it with these 100 students. 
Um, we, our process started in the morning at five o'clock in the morning, 5.30 in the morning. Our youth came in, checked blood pressure, weight. Uh, we had one group that went to the fields and did their math and science and reading from the fields. Another group cooked the food that were harvested the day before for the meal. Uh, another group uh, did gene, uh, genograms and genealogy on their family, looking at chronic disease and looking at food. And so we spent that whole summer doing that. What we really found out was that Kanita had lost about, about 400 acres of land to black land loss. The farm that we are on now that that is a community owned farm uh, is owned by the community. And so all of the funds and everything that is gained from, the, from this farm go back into human development and sustainability. Uh, the, the, from this farm, uh, you prepare all the meals for funerals uh, in the region. Only one request they ask is that they do not prepare foods that contributed to the death of the loved one. And they get a chance to talk about in the funeral and the pastor talk about chronic disease, talk about, you know, uh, how do we deal with prevention and chronic disease. And the meal that, that they receive at the repast is a healthy meal that responds to the needs of the family and they pass out pamphlets to the family. And so we've been looking at this holistic view of how do we work with faith, health, and food from a holistic standpoint and not from an economic standpoint, because if we had started on making money and, and that, that's the same sharecropper model is how do you make money? But I grew up on sharecropping and our goal was how do we put food on the table? How do we keep the community strong? How do we put food in the market? And how do we reinvest back into the community? And so we've been doing this for, uh, for 16 years. And, and so um, the, the, the community and the youth own 25 acre farm. They have enough equipment to run a hundred acre farm and they partnership with 10 other farms uh, and, and right now in collaboration, we're doing a thousand CSA boxes a week that we collaborate with other organizations to get out in the community. Thank you. I turn it back over to Shana. Thank you, Reverend Joyner, for, for sharing that and the work that you're doing down at Kanita. And thank you, um, Jerry, for sharing um, that information with us. And so we'll turn it back over to you to um, set us up for our breakout rooms and what we'll be discussing. Yeah. Um, so for those of us here who are come from, you know, people of color, um, who come from um, the South and and those of us who not, we both have different relationships to land. Um, I definitely want everyone to think about where they are and how did they, you know, how did they, what type of privilege they carry, but I also want us to think about um, if we did, if we are people of privilege and if you're white, how did you, how did your family come about getting a hold of land? Um, and talking about that as well as for those who are of people of color, if your family comes from sharecropping or they never did own land and those type of questions as well. Um, there's many stories around access and, and, and I share mine very briefly. So I, I talked about my, my, uh, my being a descendant of Stabil, my mother's father, uh, his name is, was was uh, Luther Holman, and Luther Holman uh, was a deacon, a, a pillar of the community, an East End community in Durham. And one day, when I was ten years old, I went and visited Stadville, and there was a house called a Holman House, and it struck me that this was named after my my mother's family, but I, I never heard anything about this place being related to us. 
it would be much many years later when I would find out I'm actually a descendant. Um, but ironically, where my grandfather grew up was only six miles north of this place. Um, but his father uh, was called Will Holman, was a tobacco farmer. And Will, Will's father was also named Will Holman, but he was an enslaved person that stabbed him. So the very interesting the quest became, how did someone whose father was enslaved become a landover in just one generation? Um, and I think we all can think about some of us who might be descendants of landowners, or some of us who might be descendants of sharecroppers. How did our families get into those places? And for those of us who are not, I think the question becomes, how did, you, how did your family get access to the privilege they have now? Um, whether it's around agriculture or not. We do want to focus around this topic because that's where the point of it is, um, moving into the rooms, but we just kind of want to have that focus on um, moving in there. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over uh, so we can become the, go into the breakout rooms. Um, Great, thank you. Um, so I am, this should all happen for y'all automatically. Um, and uh, there will be a little button where you can call for help if you need it. Um, and I will be giving folks a five minute warning and a two minute warning. And uh, then you'll have 60 seconds once I press the button um, before we all come back. Um, also, we're going to pause the recording as we go into breakout rooms to make sure that that's a confidential uh, space where we're not <laughs> sharing your story with the world. Um, and then we'll resume the recording uh, once we come back. Um, Jared, what time would you like us to be back uh, in this big room? Let's say 2.45. Okay. Uh, great. Um, in that case, here we go, everybody. We are recording, but with that being in mind, if there's anybody that wants to share about um, anything that, any conversation that was had in your group that you don't mind sharing that might be recorded. Um, yeah, was there anybody that like to, to speak about that or, or something that might have impacted you from sharing and having that conversation? So, so I, I'll say something. That, one of the things that we most of us saw is that um, we've we've had to move from from where we were uh, where our families are for one reason or another, um, and it, it leads to uh, some loss of connections. Anyone else? I just would really want to, I want to say that I was really impacted by just this uh, sense of shared uh, experiences in a group. The group that I was in was, you know, seemingly at face value, very different. And I thought, well, gosh, you know, I really don't have any connection here, you know, but these shared experiences are so profound, you know, when, when you talk, and I think it's because of the, the, the relationship that we're talking about, which is relationship with land, however it is. So I, I was really impacted by that. Thank you for that. I'm ready for another webinar on genealogy. We got in some interesting conversations. Yeah, yeah. I, those, I wish y'all could have kind of saw our conversation. Um, but yeah, someone else. I'm I agree. Not, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go right ahead. You got it. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, I was in the same group, and I thought it was very interesting to hear people talk about taking. Um, like a 23andMe kind of a or DNA test and um, what those said versus the um, more detailed and 
personal information that Giori shared um, without having, um, you know, you think that you sent in something for that test, you get pretty accurate information. But um, he explained a little bit of what some some of those um, terms meant, and it it was these huge areas of land. Um, so it was beautiful to see those connections be made, and for him to share that that um, knowledge. I'm I'm literally amazed. Uh, I'm I'm literally 67 years old, and what what is still is historically true today, as it was when my father was farming, is that the black community today still do not have access, you know, to 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 wealth resources and wealth building that I live in a region where 99.1% of all of those residual resources still go to the white community. And 99% and, and of all contract services still go to the majority white community. And, and we asked ourselves the same question why do we see the crime and why do we see the things in the Afro-American community? And it's not coming back that historically, we still do not have access to the stuff that we develop. And, and, and you cannot not have access and live off less than and have a generous relationship with each other when you're not well, you don't get to enjoy that which you produce. And I, I would love to see us spend some time around how do we really create access to decision-making resources and economics and residual and not charity. I really appreciated the, the question um, if, if you aren't still on the land that your ancestors had, how did your ancestors come to lose that or leave that? Mm. It's, it's not a question I've ever thought of. Mm. And it's a question I'm going to start asking people in part because it will, will focus on a different part of who they are, the land that they're from, but also it's an opportunity to, to start thinking about in, in casual conversations, how do people come to lose and to leave land, leave land? And are there differences in the conversation um, about how that happens? So it's a way of sort of entering the justice conversation that I've never thought about before, a way to, to maybe raise those questions, <clears throat> make those points without beating people over the head with it. And, you know, in my case, I will mostly be talking to white people and we'll be able to talk about what I've learned here and connect it to the stories that people tell about their own experiences. So I, I really thank you for that question. It's, it's new for me. Yeah, and with that being said, I also have to lift up the fact that like, when we talk about land in this country, to be mindful that we are like, speaking on, on it as like a second and third hand um concept because it was first owned and now and not and I don't even think indigenous people would consider it ownership in that way, but it was first indigenous people's land. Um whether it's Abia Yala, which is the southern central part of America, uh, uh Americas and then Turtle Island, which people can consider North America. Um that we're, we're speaking from it from a perspective of what happened after um, many, many generations of land being taken from indigenous people. So I want to lift that up um, as we speak on that, to end that topic. Thank you very much for that, because I think that that is really key to remember, because indigenous um, sorry about that, indigenous, uh, the indigenous concept of the land doesn't include ownership. 
So that the, the concept of ownership came with colonial uh, conquests. And, and so it is now this reality when we talk about ownership of land as opposed to relationship with land. So when I think about the relationship with land, is it in terms of ownership? Then that makes me question, you know, that makes it very political. <laughs> Are we ready to move on to the Q and A portion? Oh, okay. Yes. So, if you have um, any questions, I didn't see any questions in the chat um, earlier. And so if there are any questions that you have um, for Jerry or that you have for Reverend Joyner, um, I know I did for you, you Jerry. You mentioned a book um, when you was doing your presentation. Um, it was a second one you had, uh, but Yeah, so the, are you you talking about the new Negro by Lane Law? I, I caught that one, um, but uh -huh. it was it was a nice oh, book. It's, yeah. So Isabel Wilkerson has a book called The Warmth of Other Sons. Um, and it's a book about the Great Migration um from African Americans moving from the South to the North. Um and it has some narratives around experiences that people experience. Uh, moving from the south to the north, um, and we spoke about it in our group. Uh, one person grew up in the north, but families from the south, and it kind of un it kind of unravels the concept of being a northern. Uh, and I'm only using this from the expression of what the book would say: a northern Negro versus a southern Negro. Um, the 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 dichotomy that was created around thinking of yourself as being from the north or from the south. Um, okay. but yeah, that's, that was kind of teased out a little bit in that book. And then there's other books, um, there's other books that speak to some of those experiences. So, um, Slavery by Another Name by, um, uh, man, last name is Baptiste. Um, it talks about sharecropping, um, and I might be missing another one. Uh, obviously, the new Jim Crow speaks around some of those concepts kind of from a periphery, but yeah, there's a couple of books centered around these experiences of the African American experience in the South and in the North comparatively to each other and why there was a dichotomy created. Okay. Edward Baptiste is the name of the person who wrote um, uh, uh, Played by Another Name. It's a book about Cap. I'm, I'm curious if uh, others here have heard of the book Home Place by uh, Drew Lanham um, because it talks, he's a, he's a black ornithologist um, um, in his 60s now, I think. Um, but he, he was raised on the land and very close associated with the land. Um, and and as, as he got older, um, he lost the land because of uh, inheritance laws. Um, and excellent book, and I, in my opinion. I just wonder if anybody else had heard of it and read it. Home Place by Drew Lanham. I would also mention um, Freedom Farmers by Monica White um, is a great look at um, Black farmers' political power. Um, it talks about Fannie Lou Hamer and how connected um, food and agriculture and um, political power and like the freedom to vote were. So uh, definitely recommend that one. 
Yeah, you know, um, Sarah just put a, a question in the chat around, you know, what would reparations look like? And that kind of popped in my mind as well when my group was talking, you know, Jory, you mentioned like, you know, where is your family's land and how did they get it, right? So like, for me, my family is from Middle Tennessee. You know, if you go down a strip of a, a particular road in, in Cannon County, it'll be family and my family in every house on the road, cousins, um, uncles, whoever, they've been there like, you know, a hundred years or something, but I don't know where they got the land, you know, and whether, whether it came from unjust policies or, you know, unjust actions or whatever, I don't know, but I feel like if there was to be reparations, the only way that that could happen is if whatever happened came to light in terms of why is it that some people have land and some don't, you know? Um, oh, you're on mute, you. Sorry. sorry. Sorry, I apologize. The conversation on reparations is a huge conversation. Um, and there are economists um, at Duke who study solidarity. Um, st studies on what that might look like. Uh, I wouldn't begin as I would not begin to start on uh, trying to unfold a plan of, of that magnitude. Um, I'm not a representative of all black people, so I cannot uh, begin to tell you what everyone would need to feel repaired, right? That's what reparations stands for. Um, and I think that it's a like we go back to what we talked about earlier, like that conversation has to include indigenous people as well, um, too. It can't just be like, we're just gonna repair this one community and then we're gonna leave this other one undone. Um, that would that would be unjust as far as, for me as a black person, I would feel like I'm a part of an injustice with that being done. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, of economic knowledge that needs to be taken into account um, by people who have that capacity and that understanding. And I think that Sandy Darrett is one of those individuals. Yeah, and I think also that one of the things that complicates the issue of reparations is the sheer amount of land that's changed hands um, under duress and violence, but with legal paperwork, right? So I'm sure that there have been thousands of acres where if you go back far yeah. enough, there's probably legal paperwork to support the sale of that land, but we're also not aware of the amount of violence and intimidation, and as Jory's already mentioned, terrorism that might be associated with someone having signed away a deed. And so it gets kind of tricky when you're trying to kind of parse out who would deserve what. Um, yeah, I have a lot of questions about that myself, not that I have any answers, but one thing I think about is that the, the system that enabled people to acquire that land, really the removal of that system in, under any case would have to happen because that is the machine that created the damage, you know, and so, and who does it damage, you know? And it, and it, and if you look at it from the, the sense of uh, how the reason why indigenous real concept about land is relational, then we are all impacted by our, our, our ability or inability to have relationship with land. Um, so it, it's not about replacing one ownership with another ownership. But it's about, I would say, you know, dismantling ownership. And I don't know how that would fly. Probably people probably willing to give up a little bit and still keep some. I don't know about <laughs> I mean, we'd have to have another kind of society. But you know, I mean, that might not be a bad thing. So it is definitely complicated. It's definitely complicated. Yeah. Uh, what I was trying to say. I was reading that the, um, that the group has been saying. 
I was going to say, I would look at everything that the group had, group had been saying, but I also want to list that, um, that our country does know how to um, to um, to to do affirmative actions in ways that lift up whole groups of people. I mean, we do know how to do it. Um, that is the history of the United States. We know how to be intentional about uh, resources, land, and wealth. Um, we've done it for white people since the beginning, and we've done it for um, immigrants um, of white people um, throughout our history. So while some of it is difficult in the terms of assessing the amount of wealth that has been um, generated, um, you know, from the oppression um, and slavery of of African Americans, and then the the violence um, and stealing um, of kidnap, you know, of uh, Native Americans, but we do have precedents on on how to um, to to uh, create policies and legislations that support um, the development of wealth um, and the building of communities um, based on race. So I just wanted to lift that up. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's not impossible, right? Um, they can do it if they wanted to. Um, I appreciate that a lot. Um, I think one reason why the questions um, the reason you know when we were coming up with this is thinking about like how do we spark the um spark the mind to think about things historically um to help us kind of move through um a remembering of some of these these things that were harmful right i think oftentimes we move past it and we don't revisit it and we wonder why history repeats itself like Reverend Joyner was talking about. And it's kind of like, well, if we sit back and just think about our ancestors for a moment, um, we won't be surprised at how things are still the same in many ways and access is still not given. Um, and um, like our sister just shared, like it was done intentionally for particular groups of people and we need to remember that um, we heard you up to uh, we need to remember, Jory. Yeah, no, I, I, I that's why I stopped. We just need to remember <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we've seen it happening um, very uh, clearly in recent years, you know, where it relates to agriculture, where um, tariff relief payments for farmers, they did some data collection on that and it went to over 99% white farmers. Um, and I would put money on similar results for the coronavirus relief payments. Um, to farmers and also generally just like the small business loans seeing similar patterns and we're at a point now where you can have a quote race blind policy and the impacts of previous racism allow you to perpetuate racism with a quote race blind policy um, because of the dynamic you know like the, the inequities that you already have rolling. And I think that that will always breed infighting, competition, and not collaboration mm -hmm. in the black community on the ground level. Mm -hmm. Because there is, it's hard to share what you don't have. And so when, when, the, ours, when, the, when the, the grants hit the table, they don't hit the table in a way that collaborate our communities. It hit a way that causes us to compete and we don't share best, we don't share best values and practices. 
And when you look at your counterpart, the white farmers, they're growing 10 million sweet potato plants together. They are sharing a bunch of stuff because they got tons of more access and resources than, than, than black farmers can think about having. And, and, you know, I mean, all of the kids that come through our place farming, it's hard for one of them to think, do we want to farm? Because those resources is still, we still don't have access. And, you know, we're on a farm that was 200 years old and those black farmers through the courthouse and extension lost 75 acres of land. And he still tell the story. It's just as painful today it was that he he tell him and the guy crossed crossed from and got the land. So it's those those thank you. We 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 keep reliving this thing over and over and over again. You know, um Pastor Joyner, that is so incredible uh what you're saying because even the resources that are targeted for uh, black and 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 uh, and brown farmers uh, are going to you know the office of advocacy and outreach. I had a talk with them, but you know yes, this is money for black farmers, right? Uh, but the outreach money is is they the, the big grants are going to white led organizations. So even in a sense, even in in that sense, I mean you still have. To, it cannot, you, you don't have your sovereignty over that. You still have to have that. And they recognize that that is a problem. And, and, um, and the woman who is the head of that uh, department, she's a black woman. So they're saying, well, how can we, how can we uh, overcome that? The reality is who's the heads of these nonprofit organizations that are helping uh, black farmers? And, and then you look at who's the heads of the organizations of a lot of nonprofits, environmental organizations. I mean, we're talking about 80 to 90 some percent are our white, white leadership. So it's, it's a huge problem, you know? Um, so this, I mean, it's an obstacle, but we have to at least name it and start to work on it, start to, to, to change that so we can actually address these problems and we can address uh, the, uh, the, 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 the sovereignty over uh, creating the solutions. Mm -hmm. And you're so right with that because mm -hmm. once we identify that, it helps us to stop fighting each other because we'll see that we are not the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we are not each other's problem. And, and I think that we, 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 we got to keep telling ourselves that so we don't annihilate each other. We need each other. Um, I, I saw that um, Amir had asked earlier in the chat about, you know, databases for grants for community gauging engagement and farming to fork types of programs um you know i know of uh rafi doing some of that work not to toot our own horn but in terms of a farm of color network where we offer grants and then also through come to the table um offering grants to churches that are purchasing from farmers with a priority of farmers of color but um if anyone else knows any other um resources definitely shout them out but just wanted to make sure and we uh, make sure we address the question you had. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate that. Thank you for that. Was there any more questions 
or comments? I know that this platform does not lend itself to lengthy meetings. So um, I feel this one coming to a close, but um, I would vote for a part two. Um, this has been really enlightening. And um, when I got put in a little room to chat, I was like, oh, really? But it was, it was wonderful. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So. I'm going to ask um, Jerry, um, Reverend Joyner, Jared, any closing comments? I'm going to let you all have closing comments. <laughs> all right, well, Jared, I will turn it over to you. Well, I do want to say thank you to Sean. I am not a technology person. <laughs> And um, you kept pushing me to do this. And I kept saying, this is not going to work for me. <laughs> so let me just thank everyone uh, uh, for, for this opportunity to receive and share. Thank you, Tishon. You, you made a believer out of me. OK. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Cool. Well, I will go ahead and close this out. Um, thank you to everyone for participating in this experience with us. Um, I've learned so much through co the conversations, the comments, and especially in the breakout rooms. Um, everyone being able to share a little bit about their story and their family story and how kind of their uh, past relationships and their families with farming uh, has impacted them in the present and kind of talking through what it would mean to fundamentally change our food systems. Um, one of the things that uh, we try to focus on and come to the table is addressing root causes. And so I really love that so much of our conversation has been digging into that difficulty and not shying away from it. Um, and so thank you to everyone. Um, I'm hope, I hope that uh, you've all feel like you've been able to learn more about farming and faith in the church, um, as well as a little bit more about yourself and what the pillars of your own journey have been in your family. Um, thank you to Trishonda uh, for facilitating. Um, thank you as well to Joy and Reverend Joyner uh, for all of your insights and wisdom and guidance. Um, additionally, thank you to each of our small group facilitators, including Michelle and Sarah, um, and the, come to the table team member, Margaret, for your technical and logistical support. Um, later today, I will send out a survey. So if you're able, please fill that out. Um, we would love to hear more from you. Uh, I, I love uh, Susan being able to say that she'd like to hear a part two. Um, so please give us your feedback uh, because we definitely want uh, to hear from you and to learn what worked, what didn't, and how we can kind of shape future events uh, and improve them and make sure that we're uh, facilitating the kinds of conversations uh, that can move us toward change um, in our community. Uh, to learn more about upcoming community conversations events, uh, you should definitely visit us at rafiusa.org and I'll send some more information. Uh, but thank you all, and I hope you all have a great afternoon. <laughs>